How would you describe yourself if you couldn't mention your job or where you work? That's the question Ross and I asked each other this summer. Ross, he and I, we knew each other in high school. We played football, but we really haven't kept in touch since. But when I was visiting my hometown this summer, I reached out and we got lunch. And for 90 minutes, we talked about our lives. We shared our values, our setbacks, and our priorities. But we spent very little time talking about our jobs. And it became clear, Ross and I are very different people. We've lived very different lives. But that didn't get in the way of us finding a sense of connectedness with one another. Connectedness, it's that feeling you get, that good feeling when you're with someone that can step out from behind their resume, their accomplishments, their status, almost like they're stepping out from behind a mask, masks that we all wear. But don't confuse connectedness with connections. Connections are superficial and transactional, and that's what you do on social media. Connectedness starts from within, your true self, when you live as you are, without fear, hesitation, or doubt. And when you can do that, you can make room in your life for people that are very different from you. Now, there's a lot of things that get in the way of finding connectedness. One of those is simply getting caught up in ambitions, especially when those ambitions are defined and highly valued by the people around you. In my life, I decided I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon when I was 15 years old. And so for the next 10 years, I focused all of my efforts on getting into an orthopedics residency. You see, becoming an orthopedic surgeon became my identity. Right up until the fourth year of med school when they told me I wasn't going to make the cut. Now, I know that's not the worst tragedy to befall a human being. And so I found another specialty to go into. Life was going to be good. But during that residency, the US was going to war after 9-11. And I decided I wanted to serve in a combat role. And so I resigned from my residency and applied to the Air Force to go to pilot training without telling them I was a doctor, all at the tender age of 30. And so for the next two years, I focused all my efforts on becoming a fighter pilot, just like all the other hotshot 22-year-olds in the program with me. And after two years, they told me, you're not handsome enough to be a fighter pilot. So <laughs> I became a bomber pilot. <laughs> but at least I'm prettier than those cargo pilots. <laughs> and for the next 10 years, I worked my way up. I became an operational test pilot, and I even convinced the Air Force to let me work as a flight surgeon. I was now one of nine pilot physicians in the entire Air Force. And, and look, I'm proud of doing the things that I did where I combined being a doctor and a pilot. But the experiences that are really near and dear to me, the things that happened that I'm most proud of, didn't happen in the jet, and it didn't happen in the clinic. It was the times when I stood up for the people that served beside me, even when it upset the bosses above me. You see, on more than one occasion in my career, what I knew was right from wrong was at odds with senior leadership. I was forced to pick to do the things that I knew between what I knew was right and what they expected me to do. And it was through these really painful moral injuries that I discovered flying planes, taking care of patients, it's what I do. It's not who I am. And that liberated me. That freed me. That's why I was able to pack up my family and after 12 years in the military, go to business school without a clue of what I might do afterwards. And now, being in the private sector, I don't fly planes, I don't see patients, but it's even more clear to me now than ever before. What you do isn't who you are. And who you are doesn't have to define what you do. Look, ambition, drive, uh, and landing a high-powered job, these are all great things. 
The problem arises when telling people about your job becomes more fulfilling than actually doing your job. Now, if you're a Wall Street banker, or uh, maybe you know, you're a big-time management consultant, or maybe you work for one of the big tech companies, it feels great to tell people that's what you do. I mean, it elicits a sense of awe and respect from everyone around you. But if that's all you're getting from your job, it's like eating artificial sweetener. Artificial sweetener, it tastes great, but it has no nutritional value. And so if that's all you're consuming, you're going to end up malnourished. And that's why it's so important that you be still. Listen for that whispering, fleeting voice in your head. Your true self that wants to live as you are, without fear, hesitation, or doubt. And if you find that voice, embrace it. Run with it, because that's what's going to empower you to see the world in a totally different light. You can see that it's not a zero-sum game. It's not you competing with seven billion other people. It's just you competing against yourself to be a little better than you were the day before. And when you're able to see the world in this way, you're able to make room in your heart and in your mind for all of the people around you, no matter how different they are from you. Now, finding connectedness with yourself and the people around you, it's not easy. It's hard. It takes time and it takes work. But like every great journey, it begins with a single step. And so I want to offer all of you one step you can take today to find that connectedness. The next time you meet someone, I want you to introduce yourself without mentioning your job or where you work. Share who you are without explaining what you do, because connectedness is what each of us really needs. It's what this country needs, and it's what the world needs right now.